hearing has always been my passion for personal reasons because I suffer from a hearing loss myself, as many of my family members do. And so the restoration of the hearing mechanism, restoration of the balance system, ringing in the ear, many more questions became very pertinent. The next thing that, that, that I got interested in was, as a little kid, I was always interested in space travel. And when we studied space travel, we found that many of the, the astronauts, when they went up in, in the uh, space shuttle, had problems with concentration. They got sick to the stomach called space motion sickness, but they also had difficulties in, in concentration. They called it space stupids. And the question was, is there something about zero gravity? Was it something about the ear? Was it something about bone loss? What was going on? And so that was the first time I started really going away from the ear and the ear bones and start thinking about what happens after that. What happens after the sound hits the ear and it goes into the brain and the brain hears it? And that's what one thing led to the other. One problem was fixed, I sat back, enjoyed it, but it's time to move on to the next level. So most of our research was involved in trying to develop medicines that would help with space motion sickness without suppressing cognitive function, calculations, uh, short-term memory, long-term memory. And I got really interested in how the brain worked. And we came up with some interesting stuff. We came up with a good drug countermeasure. Um, they use that now on the space shuttle. Um, the next step will be to talk about perhaps going to Mars or going back to the moon where this will be very pertinent. We can use these medicines to help take care of space motion sickness so the astronauts can do their job very quickly and very effectively. But that led to the next question because many of my patients here on Earth complained of concentration deficits and problems with cognition with, with simple problems like with their balance and with certain conditions such as ringing in the ear. And that made me ask the question is could it be the same thing that the astronauts experienced? Could we use the same test to try to understand that? And so that's what led to the research in, in ringing in the ear. I've always disliked seeing patients in the clinic with ringing in the ear and that's because it's very very common probably 25 million people in the United States complain of it and there's absolutely no treatment for it. But it's pretty obvious that we were barking up the wrong tree. We were focusing on the ear, but even if you cut the nerve to the ear in somebody who's deaf, the ringing persists. So it's only in the last few years we started to ask the question, maybe it's the brain. And that's what led us into our research now in, in using uh, looking at different treatments for tinnitus, understanding ringing it again because so many people are bothered by it and quite frankly it's usually probably once or twice a year I have a patient who commits suicide because of the constant ringing in their ear drives them crazy. So it's an extremely pertinent problem, extremely complex. When I see a patient in clinic I'm frustrated because I, they've been to multiple doctors and I say there's nothing I can do differently. Well it's changing a little bit. With my work with Dr. Minnemeyer, who specializes in transcranial magnetic stimulation, our first question was, where in the brain is tinnitus being perceived? If I say it's not in the ear, I mean, there's no question that it starts by injury in the ear, but it's perceived and propagated by the brain. Can we use some of these tests that we assess the NASA patients or, or astronauts with to try to determine where in the brain the deficit is? We got some ideas that tinnitus was affecting cortical attention, we finally got some objective evidence that, that it was in the brain. Then we started doing functional imaging, doing PET scans where you give somebody radioactive glucose, put them in a dark and quiet room so theoretically if there's no sound, the part of the brain, the primary auditory cortex, should be totally quiet, right? Well, it's maybe in you and me, but for those of us like me who suffer from tinnitus, it's not quiet. It lights up. So we're able to focus where in the brain this is in the tinnitus patient and that was interesting. Now we know where it is. Now we have an idea what's causing it. The next question is, what can we do about it? And that's where Dr. Minnemeyer and, and his um, leadership in the Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation Lab is really taking it to the next level because what we can do now is, is that we can use a strong mag magnet and we can actually modulate brain activity for a couple centimeters deep and we can actually do it short term or with repetitive stimulation, we can actually think we can create some long-term changes in how the cells interact. So if we can find the area in the brain where the tinnitus is propagated or perceived, why can't we target that area and get rid of it? So what we're doing is we couple this strong magnet to something called a um, computer directional 
neuronavigation device so we can actually put this magnet and precisely target specific areas. And we found in our, in our preliminary work that we can probably get 50% of people some improvement in their tinnitus perception. This is a big deal because remember there's no treatment for this condition. And this is the first time we actually took a blinded study. In other words, we had the individual who had a true placebo, a sham that they could not distinguish between the active, and we compared those and found a true effect. That's big. Now, the problem is it doesn't last very long. And that's the next step. That's, that's for the future. And right now we know we can find it, we can localize it, we can make it get better. We just now need to ask the question, how can we prolong the response? And that's going to be the next step in, in our research, and it's significant. We've, we've drawn a lot of attention. There's basically about four centers in the world, and what's nice about this, it says good things about the research community. There's three in Germany, and two in Germany, one in Belgium, and two in the U.S. We're first name basis with everybody. I meet them regularly. We compete, sure we do, but all of us have the same common the goal is to help these patients. And so we share information, we review each other's papers, and I think, you know, it's very exciting for, for UAMS in Arkansas to be considered amongst the experts in this field now.